Hello, podcast listeners. It's episode 300. Ay, 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 ay. We're having a great time with this one. We're going to cover a lot of ground, folks. So sit back, relax. And if you have to take this one in on chunks, you'll know the equal stopping spot. So enjoy this episode of JJ Meets World, where I meet every single person. But Tucker has some conspiracy theories about his neighbors he's going to share in this one. And by the way, if you'd like to help support our podcast, visit JJMeetsWorld.com, where you can donate to our Patreon pick up some killer swag at our merch shop, or click the link to Apple Podcast and give us a five-star review. One, two, three, four. J.J. Gordon, sort of like that Indiana Jones in that he's always snipping out his next adventure. Yes, he is. He's always interviewing guests so he can have them on his show and they can talk about pop culture, arts, and leisure. J.J. has his flag unfurled and he likes his french fries curled and he's fun and then he twirls as he goes to meet the world. He will march into the rain even if his ankle sprain. Take a peek inside his brain. This podcast is called J.J. Meets World. Hi, Tucker. How are you? I'm good, man. I am a little beat hungover. Really? I'm uh, I'm in some pain today. Physical? Yeah. I've got a touch of sciatica. Have you ever oh. experienced sciatica before? Is that, is that where it's the feeling like up your leg, like there's yeah. a pinched nerve? Yep. So Yes, I have felt that before. And I don't know if I've got like a herniated disc or something that's putting pressure on my sciatic nerve, but I can feel it in my lower back and then it goes all the way down my leg. Um, I just took vacation from work and it was a self care vacation on the first day. I got a massage, went to a new massage place and they said, Hey, since you're a first time customer with us, you get to choose two enhancements. Mm. And I was like, well, let's talk about what my options are. They're like, you can have a heated towel. You can have a hot stone added to the massage. Now I've done hot stone before, which is nice. It's great. And as for hot <laughs> towel, I can heat a towel up on my own if I really need to. So I'm not really other. Then they had a thing called hypervolt. And I was like, Ooh, is that like electricity? And she's like, no, it's a gun we use on your back. It's one of those like massage guns where it's a ball and it goes like, and so I was like, what do you, I asked my masseuse, I was like, what do you think of this thing? And she was like, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, maybe it works for some people. Um, so what I ended up choosing was cupping. Have you ever done cupping before? I have done cupping before, yes. So uh, she goes, I'm going to use two types of cups. I'm going to use this hard plastic cup where I draw the air out with like... Uh, and she was just, basically. Yeah, and, and she was describing it, and I'm like, like the thing someone who does balloon animals uses? And she's like, yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah. And so there were 12 of those, but then before that, she used the silicone suction cup so she could in that you can move around and so she was able to like suction it move it and suction and move it um i had i finished my massage and it's weird too because they leave the cups on and then they put the sheet over your back so they can move like work onto your legs and stuff like this but the sheets being held up on top of you must be what it's like to be like a borg (laughs) right like if you ever try and wear covers as a borg so when she cupped you, it wasn't the kind that where they use the the flame it to was like not. eat up the oxygen inside. Mm-mm. Okay, and which I'm glad because I'm adventurous when it comes to self care. But it doesn't the, hurt. I mean, but the fire. I worry. I worry that like my limited amount of back hair would start on fire. Oh no 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 no! Because You're also safe. Your back hair safe. Part of me also wants to think too. Like you know, this person probably took like a two week class. And now they're doing this. And if you don't do it on a regular basis, what happens if you forget an aspect of it? For example, it's been a while since I've used my circular saw. I'd have to remind myself, oh, that's right. Like, I, if I move it too far to the side, it'll like it'll bend mm. and not work anymore. Mm-hmm. So I can remind myself. Versus someone who uses it every day, they're great. So I don't want her to circular saw me. <laughs> so I get done. <laughs> Please don't circular saw me. I know that you, when you do cupping, that it leaves some bruising, uh-huh. right? Well, I bruised, baby. I mean, bruising or hickeys? Because they're kind of I mean, they're different things. But that, a, a hickey is a bruise. Well, they're different things, no, a, kind a, of, aren't a, they? A hickey's a bruise. Like, you know, essentially okay. what you've done is you've, you know, manipulated that skin. It'd be like a, it's the same thing as like a bad pinch. Right. And so... I have these perfect circles all over my back, and I thought to myself, like, 
Oh, I'm going to a pool party on Saturday. Mm. Luckily, and I made a big deal about it at the pool party. I was like, everybody, I'm about to take my shirt off. (laughs) And I want everyone to know that I I was cupping. Yeah. This last Saturday. Right. So you, you're just going to see how this. things have shifted for you and, and what it is that's making you self-conscious. I know. About getting... now it's just, and it's like, if you looked at it, you wouldn't think that they're like a hickey, right? Like you could be say, like, did JJ fall down at a vacuum expo? Be like, yeah, I'm an athlete. That's why I have these. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, but so I did this, I did this cupping as one of the things to help my sciatica. Um, and then I, the, that didn't work out. Right. Like it didn't relieve the pain that I needed. And so the next day I went to the stretch lab. Have you heard of the stretch oh, lab? I've heard of it and I've been wanting to go to it because I did see that you went to Dude, it. I loved it. Okay. So it's assisted stretching. Yep. And people who have been athletes have probably had this. An athletic trainer probably has helped you, you know, by holding a leg and getting a deeper stretch onto something. Yeah. Um, it was awesome. And like I want to shout out to Josephine, who is my stretcher. For such a tight little compact body of hers, she was able to manipulate this big old bear in ways that you wouldn't. And I knew at one point, like I saw her put her foot up against the wall and then her other foot. So she's now using the stress between the wall and pushing on me to like get a deeper stretch. It was pretty amazing. Uh, I had two questions right off the bat for her. I was like, first of all, because when you go into stretch lab, there aren't individual booths like you would see at like a massage parlor. Right, 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 right. right. So this was just open air. There are 12 tables, just open air. So everyone else is stretching at the same time you're stretching. And my first question was like, what happens if I make like noise? And she goes, well, these people are going to be done like in two minutes. And so you'll actually have this whole place to yourself for your stretch. And I was like, oh, thank God. Because, you know, there's things like when someone's stretching, you're like, you're right there. (laughs) <laughs> and trying to <laughs> work those things out. But then my second question is like, what happens if I accidentally like fart? Yeah. Because they're stretching you that, you know, you're doing yeah. deeper stretches than you normally like. I would say it's the kind of thing where if you know, going into that day, this is happening, you're planning accordingly. So I know at least a day ahead of time, if I'm getting a massage, mm-hmm. so I'm like, okay, well I know that, you know, up until that massage, I'm not eating these foods. I'm not doing any of that kind of stuff. Cause yeah, that's, and like, Embarrassing. I didn't eat like tacos or anything like that. It's something that, you know, historically makes me pass gas, but I was worried about it. So I was concerned that there would be a point where what happens if I, t- and she goes, happens all the time. She goes, this happens all the time. She goes like, cause we're pressing on areas that you normally aren't pressed with. She's like, don't worry about it. It's fine. And I was like, thank goodness. Now I didn't. <laughs> You'd think that this long explanation is for me to tell you that I accidentally blasted. I did not. I did not. I was fine. I was cool while I was going along with it. Um, Shoot. But <laughs> I was like, well, all that build up for nothing, JJ. Why do we have to hear about Stretch Lab in the first place? But this is a pro tip for you. So when you go into Stretch Lab, you make your appointment and then they tell you, you need grip socks. Like, we don't let you just like wear regular socks. You got to have grip socks. That makes sense. Right? Yep. So I got swindled into buying $18 grip socks because those are the only ones that they had available for sale there. And oh, I was like, at Stretch, at Stretch Lab. So here's my pro tip. Number swindled, huh? I, I mean, $18 for a pair of socks. I mean, listen, you're at an airport, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. the, I mean, you're so going to blame them. If I had arrived like 20 minutes before my appointment rather than five, maybe those socks are 3D printed. Do you think about they're not? That? Trust me. Right. And like they're as grip socks go, they're good. Really? Don't get me wrong. These are the they probably connect to the blockchain in some way. The, the These are the 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 blue lobster of grip socks, right? They're <laughs> one in a million. But. Rather than spending eighteen dollars, is my pro tip. If you live in the Fargo area, you just scoot down to Sky Zone and you get one of their three dollar pairs mm, of mm-hmm. grip socks. You'll be just fine. Mm-hmm. You'll be good to go. Which brings me to my second point: Sky Zone. Someone said, "You know, it'd be great. Let's have a building that's full of trampolines, and then people can just jump on the trampolines." And I think that that is a stellar business model. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I I love the illusion it gives me that I'm good at basketball all of a sudden. Right. Or that like jumping like this is natural for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, When I first went to Sky Zone, I went with previous guest Britta Nelson and they said you can do 15 minutes for like 
five dollars, or you can do a half an hour for eight dollars. And we both said, well, we're definitely going to be jumping for half an hour. So we'll take the eight dollar. After about 10 minutes, we were like, I can't do this anymore. This is too much. It's too much because it takes a lot. Like jumping on a trampoline is good for you, but it made me think of my sciatica. So you, I've got a couple of skills that people <laughs> don't. Made- so, you know right? how fucking old you sound. Like I know, you, I, you I know. It's like it made me think of my sciatica, sciatica. <laughs> and this is the first time I've ever had problems with a sciat oh, with my, my sciatica. sciatica. <laughs> I know. I'm no spring chicken anymore, Tucker. Um. So, so but hold on, wait, wait, wait. This is a yeah, good point. Yeah, I've got two things that I do that are amazing, <laughs> and you'd look at a guy of my size and stature and be like, "There's no way he's good at those things." Number one, mm-hmm. water skiing. I'm amazing oh, when it yeah. comes to water skiing. I spent so many years of my life doing that. I can do the thing where I drop a ski like you you're out water skiing and then they go by, you know, like the cabin that you're staying at and I kick one of them off and then let that float to shore and then I slalom ski. I can do that. Number two, I am amazing on a trampoline. I bet you are. Like, I believe you 100 percent. I can do back flips, front flips. I can do all the tricks. I would say, you know, someone with your body type means that you've had to just become more aware of how your body moves through space. Just nimble, right? Nimble bimble. Um, we have our first comment from a viewer. OK. Um, previous guest, Patrick Kirby. Oh, I love Pat Kirby. And he says, congrats on episode number 300. You're the benchmark. Anyone who has a podcast strives to get to anyone. Absolutely oh. anyone is what he means. Can't oh. wait to watch you rock another 300. Thanks for being freaking awesome. And the words another and awesome, all caps. Thank you, Patrick Kirby. Well, while we're at it, we should also call out his podcast, too, because as much as I'd like to be like JJ Meets World is sets the benchmark for all podcasts, it's not. <laughs> his podcast is showing up at like number one on iTunes lists and stuff like that. Yeah. It's through He's Do Good, it. Better Consulting. He's crushing so it. So if you're not listening to Patrick Kirby's podcast, do yourself a favor right now. And, you know, like get on it because he's he's an impressive dude. And he's got uh, let's see. He's got the upcoming do gooders conference as well. I know a lot about Patrick. Kirby. He also had one of the best posts ever one time. where I'm like, this guy and I are going to be good friends. I can feel it. And it was a picture of his wife asleep on the couch. And he's like, when your wife falls asleep folding laundry, you play Red Dead Redemption. <laughs> and he, like, he, he pulled out his controller. I'm like, that's where it's at. But you should see me on a trampoline sometime. You'd be impressed, I think. I, I, I'd i be impressed, but no, I mean, I would be impressed, just not surprised. I'd be like, yeah, I mean, I kind of saw it going this way. I also think I'm really good at teaching people how to trampoline. You're also really good at short distance running. No. Like sprinting, I think. No, I'm not. I'm when, not. You're, when you're motivated? When, I, when you are motivated. Let me tell you about a, a situation that happened recently with me in my day job. So That involves sprinting? Yeah, it does. <laughs> so the... Chamber of Commerce here does uh, like a track and field day every year, and they rent out a university's entire athletic com- complex. Uh, so this was at Nemzik Field at Moorhead State University. Or is it Minnesota State University Moorhead or Moorhead State University? I can't remember which. Minnesota was. State University of Moorhead, I believe. Home of the Dragons. I believe. Scorch. Yeah, Memsum. So Went there for a month. Went there for a month. There you go. Good for you. Yeah. I've and I've been there to shoot sh- several short films. Yes. You know? I've been on the campus many times. <laughs> yeah. So my boss signs us up for track and field day. And we get there. And we're like there are some people on our staff who are super athletic. You know, Don, Brooklyn, these people who have sports as a part of their history. Right. And then there's me, right? right. And they're right. like, JD, you're gonna be on our team. Now the first event we did is they put out a dozen hula hoops. And you had to hop from one hula hoop to the other. And you had a team starting on the opposite side. So it's in a line coming towards each other. And when you encounter each other, you have to do rock, paper, scissors. And whoever wins gets to continue jumping. And the other team, that person goes the other line. They come over. And the idea is that you're essentially beating a person enough so that they can't get to your end and score a point. Got it. Right. So it's like, God, this is all today is no sweat. We can do this. The next thing was you had to run out to a field and you had to find a marker underneath cones it was kind of like a under some cones there's a marker hidden and then you gotta find it and then you gotta make a rainbow with like the colors but we gamed it because we watched the previous team do it and i'm like there's purple there's green there's yellow there's orange and then they timed it then we went and started playing like frolf against a team that was or not frolf the ultimate frisbee 
And this team was intense. So intense that at one point when I tried to catch the Frisbee, I nailed this woman like square on oh. and knocked her back. <laughs> I tumbled over her. This is probably where my sciatica like probably got hurt. I'm just thinking of this now. I should get some employee, uh, you know, like workman's comp on uh, this. <laughs> but we played kickball against a team that was like too in- Like it was way too intense. So. We feel dejected because we're coming in last in like every single round that we're doing. And then the only thing that feels better is apparently there's a trophy for the team that comes in last. So I'm chatting with this guy named Morgan who works for an auction company I know. And he's like, hey, what's going on? I'm like, oh, God. I just did a kickball. And it was awful. And I was running and I was trying to get people out. And like, like at one point, they didn't even call it. It was like 29 to zero. That's not even fun. It's not fun. So he goes, oh, are you guys in the competitive league or the fun league? And I go, what do you mean? He goes, there's two things you could sign up for, competitive league or fun league. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, our last competition was a crossword puzzle. (laughs) And I'm like, what, like a giant crossword puzzle where you had to drop stuff from like a balloon or something like that? And he goes, no, no, we just sat down and we had to solve a crossword puzzle. And it was things like teamwork and fun and printers. (laughs) And so I was like, wait, what? And so our boss had signed us up for the athletic side of things. Okay. So the last thing that you had to do involved you sprint, like it was a a relay where you had to sprint and then you had to like use a pool noodle and jump over a pool noodle and like, it was just crap. I hated it. It was awful. And you did it in front of all these other teams out there. There were thousands of people at this event. Like companies had like groups from everywhere. Dude, that sounds like a nightmare to me. It was. No, thank you. It was. And it was hot out. Ugh. And then like, I, I know there are some other teams other than ours, but like we brought beer. And so we were drinking beer while we were doing I, it. You know, I, I am so unfriendly. I really am <laughs> in large groups or just with most strangers, yeah. like depending on the situation. I had someone approach us in the backyard last night when we, me and some friends were having a bonfire. And like one in the morning, we were about to douse it. And this like dark shadowy figure just literally just approached and said, can I join <laughs> well, and, <laughs> to our group? And what was your feeling? I, I I mean, I was like, who is this person? They said they were a neighbor and never met him before. <laughs> I literally, and I, I just saw this like shape in the shadow yeah. of this person staring at us. And I said, hey, we're, we're just shutting it down for the night, man. Ooh. And then he goes, oh, okay. Then he just stood there and looked at me. But it made me feel like I was being Dennis from... Um, it's always sunny in Philadelphia sure. when they move to the burbs and they run into Wally. Who's always saying it's hot out here. The thing is, is I am a nice person, but sometimes I'm like, I just don't want to right now. Just, yeah. just not now. No, the, go, everyone's go got their own boundaries, right? Like there's I'd like sometimes to play alone, please. You mm-hmm. know? Yeah. Sometimes you just want to get to the grocery store without someone like talking to you being like, isn't that pasta salad the best? There is one. I'm, I know he is a sweet person. I know he is, but he's one of the beggars at the grocery store that I frequent and he is the friendliest guy, but it's too much. It's way too much. And if it's almost, it's so far that you would think it's an act, but I know it's not. I know it's just, he's just, this is his personality. But anytime I see him, I'm like, I'm going to try to not be in the lane that he's begging right now, except they can just trade off however they want. So sometimes I think I've avoided him and I get him there. And I'm going to ha- he's going to comment on just about everything. Oh, wow. You're making a salad. Oh, I love salads. I got to make salads. A lot of cat food. Oh, you must have a lot of kitty cats. They're going to love this food. And he'll just narrate the entire time. He's just commenting on all the items that are everything coming down. Everything. And, and he's got the energy. Oh, condolence of, card. I'm sorry. Right. Like, <laughs> exactly. I'm like, if I had like lube in there, you know, or something, mm-hmm. he'd be like, oh, someone's going to have fun tonight. Right. But he uh, he's got the energy of that guy from Office Space with all the flair. And yeah, Jennifer and from Anderson's like job. from the other place, like how about some jalapeno pop? Like really into it, really, really into it. And have you seen the price? I, that of jala- does not mesh with my personality at all. Have you seen the price of jalapeno poppers lately? Like I, if you buy them in the grocery store, I I don't buy them, so I'm actually I don't follow the price. There are ten of them for fourteen dollars, a dollar forty, and I think it's because the price of bacon's gone so high. Mm, okay. So just putting that out there. Good to know. I was flabbergasted. There's another old man moment for you where I was like, oh, I'm not paying that. That's outrageous. No, thank you. I'll but make then, my own jalapeno poppers. But then you bite into one. You're like, oh, my sciatica. <laughs> so you eat it. It does. I mean, spicy foods do irritate my lower back in yeah. a way that, not, you know, most others don't. 
Um, Can we talk about the fact that you're wearing a t-shirt that's 20 years old? Yeah. Right now I'm wearing a Don Quixote's and Provsicles shirt. Yeah. On the back. It, like These are the shirts that we wore for my high school improv troupe, the Don Quixote's, the longest running improv troupe in the state of North Dakota. And on the back, it says Papa Smurf, and then my number is J and then squared. You know, I actually never knew what your nickname was, so your nickname was Papa Smurf. No, no, I chose this for myself. I felt... Oh, I know. I mean, I mean your improv team nickname, which is just the thing that goes on the back of your shirt. Yeah, I just chose this because I had chose Let's Duet, mm. D-U-E-T, mm -hmm. the year before, and I got a lot of flack from people. And so when they're like, because you got to put something on the back of your shirt... And at this point, I was pretty much running the club solo. Mm -hmm. And so I really felt that Papa Smurf was a great way to describe what I do <laughs> for the great. people there, right? No, I totally see it. Um, also, do you give, do you like, do you buy into the, like, the Smurfs are, it's all about communism or it has a, like a lot of allusions to the Ku Klux Klan? Here's why I don't follow those theories anymore. Um, quick shout out to Mikey Sunrum, who's watching and it knows the beggar I'm talking about and says, Oofta, I know which beggar you're talking about. <laughs> Oofta, friendly commentary on every item. Isn't that annoying, Mikey? Oh, that's the worst. Um, but no, the reason why I actually don't buy into that what theory. What if that beggar, hold on real quick. What if that beggar solved like a kidnapping or a murder? Then, then because he's commenting on it, he's like, he's like, oh boy, buying a lot of bleach, huh? A couple bleaches for you here. And he's like, didn't last time you buy a bag of lye while you were here? And he goes into, he's like, hey, police officer, he's listen. He's got this like savant recording <laughs> yeah. of everything every person has bought. This guy bought a, a lot of this and he goes, and he had been buying a lot of cat food, but now he doesn't buy cat food anymore. Mm. So, no, because the reason I don't follow that, even though Smurfs are not Hanna Barbera, right? What were, who are they? Who created Smurfs? Uh, what what no, property do they belong the to? Smurfs are, it, it's a weird company like from like Denmark or okay. something like that. Okay. Because like they were like, le, le, I must be French, Les Schrumpfs. I had heard a fan theory, a conspiracy theory about the Flintstones and the Jetsons. And I had to check in with you mm -hmm. on the canon of how, what happened when they met. Because there was a theory about how. They actually live in the exact same time period, but it's a post-apocalyptic world where there are people who live on the surface mm. who kind of remember how things used to be and have some of that technology, but have gone back to the you know Stone Age, basically. And the Jetsons are the rich who live up in the stars above the planet, right? Gotcha. And that it's actually the same time period. But then I, I asked you... When the Jetsons met the Flintstones, did that involve time travel? And you said, yes, it did. It did. Because uh, uh, Elroy, Elroy invites, invents a time machine because right. he's a smart little guy. He's a smart kid. Therefore, it's not the same time period. They had to travel back in time. So that squashed that. So I think there's probably, you know, it's an inventive fan theory for the Smurfs to be. Mm. It's all about, you know, a communist theory and stuff like that. But I think ultimately it really is uh, applying uh, a lens in hindsight going, well, this maps on pretty easily, mm -hmm. so we can absolutely make it about this. Just like Quentin Tarantino's theory that Top Gun is actually about homosexuality. Sure. Right? It's a really interesting theory. Mm -hmm. uh, here's something I noticed. Recently, when my wife was out of town for the night, I watched 1990s The Jetsons The Movie. which The Jetsons The Movie? The Jetsons The Movie. The Jetsons The, Jetsons, the, the movie. movie. Okay. Yep. And so it was a huh. theatrically released film version of the Jetsons and it uses like early CGI to like, you know, create this asteroid and stuff like that. It's kind of neat. Like what seeing year? all this 1990. Okay. And they, I read like a ton of stuff about it because George O'Halloran, who had done the voice of George, or is that George O'Halloran? Is that his name? They both were named George. I don't know. Maybe that's what, whoever the voice of George Jetson died while they were recording this movie and so someone oh, had to shit. step in and like fill in like a couple of gaps and stuff like that so george's voice is kind of uneven through the whole thing it's the same voice for jane is from the television series it's a different voice for elroy i believe but they chose tiffany pop singer tiffany to do the voice of judy jetson and that was a huge thing because the girl or the person who had done the voice of judy was still alive and they thought that that was like a real slam Anyway, what I'm getting into, 1990, I was seven years old when this movie came out, and it was my first real, my first real foray into like global warming, mm. 
because at the very beginning of the Jetsons, the movie, after they set up what's happening, which are these small little creatures are ruining Spacely's orbiting or asteroid, it cuts to the Jetsons opening theme and then it cuts to the Jetsons home and it's a giant like condo in the sky, right? There's a big pillar that leads down to what you assume is Earth, but there Rosie gets up first and she notes that there's the smog has lifted higher. Mm -hmm. And so they have to raise the building up like another like 50 feet to be above the smog. And so as a kid, I started piecing together the fact of like, so that's the reason why they live up there. It's not Mm -hmm. because it's more convenient. It's because we've ruined the planet and caused enough pollution that now we have to like live a thousand feet above the yeah. surface of the earth. Yep. I thought that was pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. JJ, I'm going to step out for a moment to use the facilities, but oh. we're live. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, I can talk so about our, I'll go- talk about our uh, sponsor for this episode. Yeah, I'll be right back. We are sponsored by local union number 44, the Grocery Beggars Union. Uh, today, it is one of the absolute best times, if you are a grocery beggar, to consider becoming a member of the union. Without a doubt, the local team here, they are going to do things like make sure that you get the right kind of gloves. If you're handling paper bags, those nasty paper cuts can lead to infection. And so getting the proper workplace attire, make sure you're getting the proper amount of breaks and refusing to triple bag anything. These are the things that you get with collective bargaining through the Grocery Baggers Union. Check them out today. You're going to go to baggersunion.biz. That's baggersunion. Dot biz. Now, back to our regular scheduled show. I have been working on a project at home, and it's I've gotten to a difficult point here where I don't know what to do with it because I've built up the fact that I got this sandbox that looks like a tugboat that was made in the early 2000s, and there's some areas I really need to work to like kind of shore it up, but it floats, and you can put a trolling motor on it. If you want, and the state of Minnesota will actually license it as a, you know, as a water vessel. And that's what I really want to get done is like get it labeled as a water vessel and move along with it. But I'm I'm just a little bit concerned that the project's not going to work out the way I wanted. So the first thing you do is there's a void underneath this thing that you fill with marine flotation foam. So it's a Oh, it's a closed cell expanding foam and you can't just use like a spray can of foam because it has to be the closed cell kind. So it won't absorb water or it only absorbs, you know, like a small, small, small amount of water. So it won't get waterlogged. That adds some buoyancy. But I was thinking that in this void instead, what if I got an inflatable kids pool and kind of shoved all of that in there and then inflated it from there? And I thought maybe that could work, but. I've been doing a lot of research. Thank God for Reddit. Who's not using Reddit for stuff right now? Because it is curated. It is really well done, like using Reddit to find out if you've got questions. I've almost stopped just Googling stuff because any Joe Schmo can write a blog on replacing the knob on your oven. But on Reddit, you can post it, and then there are people who actually go through and moderate some of those conversations, and I really, really appreciate that. And then you can also like add pictures and things like that to it. So if you're not using Reddit yet, you really, you absolutely should be. But I'll just, you know, it's what it is. I also recently got to wear a World Series ring. Um, I met Paul Molitor. And Kent Herbeck and uh, I was like, hey, could I wear your World Series ring? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. You got it. And like pulled it off his finger, handed it to me. And so is the the World Series ring from 1987, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. But it was pretty impressive for me to be able to wear a World Series ring. And I'm not a big baseball person myself, but I understood the grandeur of a world series ring when it was right there in front of me at that time. It was like, I I knew the importance of what this thing was. And it reminded me a little bit of Ace Ventura pet detective. That's exactly what I was just going to say. I was (laughs) going to say before you got a look at it, did you look at his pee pee while he was going to the bathroom? Then he punched you in the forehead. So you could count the amount of gems in the, in the imprint. Mm -hmm. Nope. Nope. And I didn't arm wrestle a guy for it. Dude, Ace Ventura pet detective 
immediately brings me back to a time and a place. Yeah. It brings me back to, so uh, my dad had a house uh, near Oak Grove. So not the one on South Terrace, the one on North Terrace. Okay. We called it the crack house as a joke because it was just dilapidated and run down. Um, and I you rem- know what it takes to make a crack house a crack home? <laughs> Family. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> uh-huh. Nice. And uh, no, I just remember that that was when I saw the ads on TV. And I thought the ads were the funniest thing I'd ever seen. Mm, and sure. I, before even seeing the movie, I kept repeating the line of do not go in there. Woo! Because I believe that was in the trailer. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then I remember distinctly the dad, dad taking Brianna and I to go see it. And the opening sequence as the UPS or HDS or whatever the, the UPS analog is they have there as he's delivering it and he's destroying the package in the opening credits. I was dying. I was laughing. Right. I was in. It's a great opening to a movie. I was in hysterics. Let me see. Was this 93? 94. 94. So I was in like the third or fourth grade at that point. Right. So I was nine or 10 years old. And so I'm losing my mind. I didn't know anything on this planet could be that funny. I just thought it was the best thing ever. Right. Um, Because he does a cartwheel where the box is the bottom and he smashes it. And he does like a slap to the side. I, Jim Carrey is a cartoon. And as I had never seen him in anything before, the very first thing of him that I saw was Ace Ventura. Um, Even though I think he had just filmed the mask before that. So to briefly interrupt, 1994 is a huge year for Carrie because yeah. Ace Ventura gets released. Mm-hmm. He's still in, in Living Color. The Mask is released in 1994. Dumb and Dumber is released in 1994. Right. And then in 95, he has back-to-back Batman Forever and Ace Ventura When Nature Calls. Because I, I, I feel like I read this recently that they essentially got him on the mask for under a million dollars because the contract got signed before Ace Ventura came out. Sure. Once Ace Ventura came out, then he signed a multi-million dollar one for Dumb and Dumber. Mm-hmm. And the the mask producer's like, woo, like we just saved a ton of money just for the timing of it, which is pretty crazy. Have I ever told you my Jim Carrey story from Estes Park? No. So uh, Estes Park, Colorado is where the Stanley Hotel is. And the Stanley Hotel is where Stephen King had a ghost experience at the end of their season that mm-hmm. inspired The Shining. Okay. So if you ever watched the made for TV version of The Shining that came out like in the like late 90s, they actually filmed it at the Stanley Hotel. Is that Jeff Park. Daniels? No, it's, uh, it's uh, Pol- Steven no. Weber from Wings. <laughs> I, I, and went Rebecca Jeff Daniels, and I went Jeff Daniels and Bill Pullman before <laughs> I got to Steven Weber. You're right. Now um, I see it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it follows and like Stephen King makes a cameo in that one and it's much closer to the book, but it is a drastically different story than like what Stanley Kubrick's The Shining is. So I, anyway. love, I love how Stephen King looks like a monster in like a horror film. Right. This does. So Stephen King's experience when he's there is his, he shows up with some family members and they ask to stay at this place and they're like, well, it's really only like the staff here now we're closing down and he goes, okay, well. You know, I'll just I'll stay for a couple of days. And so they're like, all right, as long as you don't mind us packing up everything and putting it away, because it was a it's a mountain resort. I didn't know that there was an actual basis. Yeah. To King actually being at one. Yeah, it's a it's and it's a mountain resort. So it's really only, it was, and it was hard to get to during the winter. So late fall is when they're kind of shutting everything down. He was planning on writing while he was there. Yeah. Okay. Doing some work. And so uh, he is walking through these giant grounds and it's a huge old, like probably built in the twenties, like, you know, lodge and they've added on to it since then. But so he's walking around and he stumbles upon this like party going on in the ballroom. And so he goes in there and he has some great conversations and he talks to people and they're like, yes, you know, we season here every year and it's a big deal. So then he goes and he's asking somebody about the, the ballroom and they get like white as a ghost and they're like, you saw people in the ballroom and he's like, yeah, yeah. I was just down at this fun, like end of the year event. And they explain that those are the ghosts that haunt the Stanley hotel. Mm. And he goes, there's no, there's no one in the ballroom. And he goes, there's only 10 people left on site. And we were all 
down packing away a dock or something like that. And there have been all these sightings all over the Stanley. And so this guy explains that, you know, there was something that tragic that happened in room 213 and all this kind of stuff. So in Dumb and Dumber, when they are in Aspen, the hotel that they shoot at is actually the Stanley Hotel in Estes. And Jim Carrey finds out that this is the hotel that The Shining's based off of where Stephen King had this like ghost experience and insists on being put in room 213. So when I was at the Stanley, this is a story that they tell as okay. part of it. So, you know, you can you picture like those big that big staircase where he's walking down like in his weird cowboy yeah. gear and like when they pull the Ferrari up to the front of it. Like, so this is the Stanley and it still looks the same way today. And so... Uh, it's the first night that Jim Carrey is staying in the Stanley Hotel, and they were going to shoot there for like another week and a half to get all of these scenes. And at 2.30 in the morning, he comes like just running downstairs, and he's only wearing his underpants. And he waits outside for a cab in the Colorado cold for 30 minutes until this like cab is able to get there and wouldn't go back into the building and goes and stays at like a day's in instead. And the next day he tells the Farley brothers, I will only go in there the moment you're ready to shoot. I will not go in there for stand-ins. I will not go in there for this. You say action, I will do it. And then I'm getting out of that building immediately. And Jim Carrey had some kind of experience when he was staying in this haunted room that freaked him out so much that even today people have like tried to goad him into talking about it on, on shows and he will like end an interview. Huh. And like be like be like I'm not talking about that. Interesting. So, uh, they also hire a guy who looks kind of like Jack Nicholson <laughs> to walk around wearing sunglasses and like tux- a tuxedo, so you can take a picture with him on like big weekends. But I was in Estes Park over Halloween once, and they throw a big like Halloween ball, and like it's super fun. And what's interesting about the hotel itself is it's built into the side of the mountain. So when you go down into like the basement where their like kitchens and everything are. One side is like drywall and the other side is like ro- like a cave wall, mm. like it's rock. Mm-hmm. And so it's just it's fascinating. Also, they've got great Rocky Mountain oysters there. Have you ever had Rocky Mountain oysters? Aren't those testicles? Bull testicles. Yeah. Yep. No, they're good. They're really good. I don't want them. You should try them. I don't care. Why don't you want to eat testicles? Because I don't want to. Just, I'm just curious. curious. I like, don't what, consent. What, are, what is it? But you but you'll consent. eat a hot dog? I'll eat a hot dog. It's virtually the same thing. Puree them then. Yeah. But don't, don't, they better not Wait look a like, minute. they better so not you're look telling like me two if fucking I pure, balls. If you tell me if I puree, well, first of all, they're giant, right? Because they're bull <laughs> testicles. <laughs> so exactly. they're huge. Why would I, why would I want to be like, oh, look at these two giant balls in front of me. I can't wait to cut into these things. What do you think about, Listen, dude, about eggs all the time, even, right? Dude, I don't even like <laughs> buffalo wings with the bone in them, right? <laughs> like, I want my food to look so divorced from the mm. animal it was sourced from. Right. I want my my chicken machine separated, okay. man. So, no, if Not I'm going to go- have Rocky Mountain oysters, yeah. gr- grind them up and put them in a brat, and then I'll try them. Okay. I think I can make that happen. Watch out for episode 302. <laughs> uh, also, I, I wanna, don't understand. I want to note that at like, one point was like, huh. They were looking at a bull running through the field and they were just looking at his balls and they were like, you know what? I could try those. People like people always talk about like, well, yeah, Jim Carrey like breaks out and or Jim Carrey's like Ace Ventura like puts him on the map. And I'm like, you know, that's not really true because Jim Carrey had had like not an ultra successful, but had been in movies before. I mean, his becoming a uh, household name certainly is Ace Ventura, but like, let me throw a couple of like previous titles out there that, uh, isn't there a skiing one, a skiing one, like one where he was at a ski resort, probably like, but very early in his career, he's got a movie called once bitten where he's the main character who there's a sexy female vampire and she's like, it's like she's making him like the new Renfield and is like, he's like a virgin and it's a whole thing. But once bitten was a movie that came out that was really like popular. Um, And then earth girls are easy in which he stars with, I think it's Damon Wayans, Jeff Goldblum, Gina Davis, Judy Tartugula, who was very popular at that time. <laughs> yeah, you're not reading that off a list. And then, uh, no, 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 seriously. Judy Tartugula, who kind of had this like quirky voice, and I think she did some music at the time, but I am I think that's how you say her last name, is Tartugula or something. It's something similar to that. Um, but the movie Earth Girls Are Easy, about some aliens who see Gina Davis in a bikini and crash land their ship into a pool, and they're covered like completely in hair, 
and then Judy Tartugula <laughs> shaves them, and uh, they don't like speak English. They like, <laughs> um, and they that's how they communicate. And then I believe Gina Davis leaves with them to go to outer space at the end. But her boyfriend, I think, is Charles Rocket. Who is a real jerk? He, Charles Rocket, I think, was the first guy fired from SNL for swearing, oh, for dropping really? the f bomb. And then he was in the It's Pat movie. I was just thinking about that the other day because Ween is in that. Yeah, that was the first time I ever knew what Ween was. I'm Gene Ween. I'm Dean Ween. We're Ween. That's how they introduce <laughs> themselves, and they get Pat to play a part in it with Julia Sweeney. Have you heard of the movie Some Girls? Some girls? Yeah. No, I've heard of those girls. The, it's it's from 1988, and it stars Patrick Dempsey. Mm, you know, Patrick okay. Dempsey. Yeah, oh, I know Patrick Dempsey. Well, he's McDreamy? McDreamy, I he's think. He's one of the Mick. Mick Steamy, I McDreamy. I think he's McDreamy. I know Patrick Dempsey from Money Can't Buy Me Love. Greg Carlson was telling me about this movie, Some Girls, and he's like, hey, while you're out, on your uh, VHS collecting yeah, binge. Look for some girls. You really want to pick up some girls. And I was like, well, why is that? And he says, because you can see Patrick Dempsey's penis mm. in it. So apparently, um, when they shot the movie Some Girls, they actually shot it full frame. They shot it four by three instead of 16 by nine. What? Yeah. Uh, but they They're shot. Like, TV's the future, kid. I, I don't quite know exactly what, what they were doing, right? But there's a scene. So, okay. So they shot it full frame. But then cropped it for, I think, the HBO release or something like that. It was on HBO or something. So they cropped it 16 by 9 in letterbox. So when you're watching it on TV, it's cropped with letterbox bars. Well, there's a scene where Patrick Dempsey is naked and he talks to his penis. He has a conversation with his penis. And he did the scene fully nude. And they shot him fully nude. Mm. And... But it's only in the full frame Mm. cut of the movie. You can see that. Well, the VHS release is the full frame cut. And the TV release itself was the cropped cut. So if you want like a full frontal male nudity scene of Patrick Dempsey talking to his penis. You need the VHS. You need the VHS copy, which makes Mm. it very collectible. Interesting. I wonder if Jim Carrey has a movie where you can see his penis. You can see a little sliver of it in Ace Ventura. Is it Ace Ventura or When Nature Calls? when he comes out of the rhino. Oh, it's it's nature calls when he comes out of the rhino. You're right. You remembered. We both remembered when we saw Jim Carrey's penis. <laughs> um, That's right. Like a little sliver of it. Yeah. Just like a, a little tiny baby bit. Um, you know, there's been rumors for years that they're going to make an Ace Ventura three. And I just don't think that it's going to happen. I 100 percent want that. Do you? Why not? Like Carrie today? Like because yeah, dumb and dumberer did not turn out. Oh, I'm that sure. Well. Listen, I mean. I, I get it. There's always the chance. There's a really good chance that it'll suck. That's fine. Let's take the chance. I'd rather have a sucky Ace Ventura 3 at this time. Just go, let's see what they do with it. Do you know that there's an Ace Ventura Jr. out there where a kid plays the illegitimate son of Ace Ventura? That's right. Yeah, it's available. I believe it went straight to digital mm, download. There's no way it was anything other than that. Yeah. Well, and then don't forget, there's also the animated series. Ace Ventura. Ace Ventura, the animated series, aired at the same time I the have, Mask animated series. I have a disc with the animated, with some animated uh, Ace Ventura yeah. on it. Ace Ventura. I'd like to call out a podcast that frustrates me right now. Um, I know that our podcast, Brothers and Sisters, we should all be playing nice in the sandbox together. But this is movie one again that you're always hating on no, but listening to all the time. It's a different movie one. <laughs> this is not now playing. Uh, So I was at a wedding recently and I was chatting with our good friend, Will, Will Block. And Willie was telling me that he uh, had to stop listening to my radio show because the truck that he uses, the radio went out in it and they're not going to fix the radio. So he's only been able to listen to like podcasts and stuff. And I did say we are streaming on the World Wide Web so you can listen to it live. He's like, that's too much work. Gotcha. So. He's been listening to this one called uh, Blank Check with Griffin and David. And I will right away say I totally compliment these guys for Eric having... Griffin, the stand-up comedian? No. Okay. But one of them played th- like Arthur in the Tick series that was on Amazon, I believe. Okay. Um, And these guys, like, these guys know a ton of people in the industry. So it's almost like people who are 
semi-famous already doing a podcast about movies. Who played the tick in that one? This guy, Griffin. Oh, I thought you meant he played Arthur. Oh, no, no. Who played the tick? I don't remember. Who played the tick? Keep in going. That. Sorry. Uh, he oh, played oh Arthur, I remember now. Arthur the Moth. I remember now. So this podcast that I've been listening to, I want to compliment them because they do a deep dive into research. They're friggin' amazing when it comes to like the research that they do into this. And so they do like a sometimes do a media thing, you know, like, oh, what kind of toys came out with this? Blah, 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 blah. But they also they also try and like I feel like ruin things that I love by like calling out how crappy they are. And I was like, right, but at the time these were, you know, cutting edge effects that they were using in Back to the Future. Also, they film they finished filming Back to the Future and then it came out three months later. That's how short the window was for them. They were editing this movie at the same time because it had to be released, and Universal was like, You're gonna make this thing go off. So that's intense when you're like developing film. Yeah, right? Exactly. Because it's not even digital at that point, right, right? Right. And you're building sets and you're changing things around. So it's not like you can go do pickups really easily. So um, but they sometimes they just ruin the things that I love on it. And I it drives me nuts. And like ruin because they're just complaining about it? Yeah. And then there's some things where, you know, these people like call themselves like movie aficionados, but they're like, yeah, I hadn't actually seen Back to the Future 3 until recently. And I was like, what? How could you have not seen a movie until recently? But they do bring on some guests that are pretty fun on a regular basis who talk about essentially they pick a movie and they talk about it and they do like director series. Mm -hmm. So I've listened to all almost all of the John Carpenter series. And then I'm on Robert Zemeckis right now. And they keep calling Robert Zemeckis like the ultimate boomer because he talks about how great everything was in the 50s and how crappy everything is now. And I'm like, well, that's interesting. Um, but what do you what do you what are you going to do right. when it comes down to it? Uh, how often do you mow your lawn? Actually, I've been keeping up a pretty good pace um, once every other week. Just about I just mowed my lawn yesterday and we uh, uh, we just got a new weed whacker. Thank God. Nice. And it's like an electric one now because the old one Even was better. leaking fuel and just wasn't turning on. And my landlord was like, I can fix it. We might. I was like, let's just get a new one for like 70 bucks. I'll, you know, and he did. And then he loved it. Right. So awesome. Like we've got a, a brand new electric one. Um, and I noticed that he went with the brand Black and Decker. Yeah. Should you not? I'm just I thought that was interesting. I would have assumed Black and Decker myself. Like I just mm -hmm. would have gone straight for it. But then I started using that. That thing is awesome. I yeah. love it. I love it. So I went hard on the the whacking of the weeds. The whacking of the weeds. I even went and kind of I I've I'm really into all these YouTube channels now where you watch people mow lawns. Have you seen these? Yeah. They're awesome because yeah. well, you know it, it's a it's a brilliant brilliant business strategy where they literally just, they go around their city and they go, let's find an overgrown lawn. And if the owner's cool with me cutting it, I'll do it for free. And I'm just going to film it and then put it on my YouTube channel and monetize it and mm -hmm. get millions of views and make money that way. Brilliant. Right. It, it's, it's one of those things where it's very satisfying, right. To yeah. watch someone mow a lawn. Like you're like, Oh, are they going to be able to get this whole lawn mowed? And right. then like, yeah, you, you, you sort, you get that feeling of, um, of accomplishment with them, that feeling of a job well done without having actually done mm -hmm. any work. I noticed you were looking at a power washing video game. Uh, yeah, it's a video game where you power wash stuff. Is so, it VR? Yeah. Okay, I'm thinking about getting that too. Yeah, because I love power washing in real life. And the yeah, thought that yes. like I could do this during the winter and like have a virtual power washing experience. And what's great is they got everything that you want about it, right? Like you can have like the 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 power washing nozzle that's longer, but not as like hard. So you have to like go over the same area, like three times mm -hmm. to cover it or the one that's very like finite. So like you don't get as long of a stripe when you're power washing, but it goes all the way down. Like you can also cut concrete with yeah, it. it. It's, it's so genius. Well, I, in these lawn mowing uh, things, I I've seen them with the weed whacker. They'll go in and really carve out a groove between the sidewalk and the lawn itself. Because so much uh, dead grass gets caught underneath there, and, and you really kind of want to try to open that up if you can, just so that new grass can grow. It's and called stuff. edging. Edging. Yeah. So I, I've got an edger. It's my favorite thing that I do every year. Well, I just I just used the the, the weed, weed whacker to do it. Like you turned it. it and like. Yep. Loved it. It it was like oh this is like getting your cuticles done. 
Yeah. Right. It was, it just felt so good, even though I'm not physically feeling what the lawn is feeling. Mm, mm -hmm. That was really, really nice. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm slowly but surely getting to the point where at some point in the near future, I'm going to be a homeowner and I'm starting to see the allure of the lawn itself of like being able to take some pleasure in the work, even mm -hmm. though the work can suck. It can definitely suck. And I time it out. Like if I'm mowing the lawn that weekend really depends on the humidity level. Sure. Cause they're like, you know what? To hell with it. I'm just gonna let it go for right now. I don't care. Are you a uh, left to right or an up and down? I no, it's actually a little bit of chaos, but the first thing I do is so I, 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 uh, outline the area I'm going to focus on first. So you do a perimeter? I do a perimeter sweep back and forth of, of where it meets the sidewalk in the driveway and just completely outline it a couple of times. Cause that feels good. Like I'm like, Oh, this feels nice. It feels right. And then I, then now I've got like a, a, a zone that's totally demarcated. And then I go over that, a cut, like I'll do a, a vertical and then a horizontal pass on it just to make sure I really get everything. If I'm feeling it, sometimes mm. if I'm like, I just got to get this done, then I'll just do one pass in either direction. But there's also like, I've got trees in the way. There's mm -hmm. obstacles in the way that you have to go around. So you can't quite so easily do like a check and mark pattern. So I am a diagonal guy. And I do a different diagonal, diagonal. each. Yeah, I do a different diagonal each time. So uh, I bet your dad loved seeing that growing up. So like, here's the damn this fucking diagonal. Until I was twenty five, I had never mowed a lawn before, because we had a lake place. So we actually had a service who came and did it in Fargo, right? Because no, none of our family was in town except for my dad during the summer. Nobody, and so. At the lake, that was my dad's job because it was my dad's Zen stuff, right? Like he'd get down there on a Thursday night and that's what he wanted to do is he wanted to like mow. And we had not a huge front yard, but like enough that like it took him probably two hours to mow the whole thing. It was a little John Deere, non-self-propelled, like he, he'd curse a lot while he's trying to prime it, like to get it to start. And uh, this is how I get away from your mother. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It's like this and golf. Yeah. <laughs> like, and my dad wore white sneakers without <laughs> socks and just shorts, like just like baggy shorts when he mowed. And so he get this awesome tan. And so mowing, like I had probably pushed a mower a couple of times, but I'd never really mowed a lawn. So when I became an adult and we got a home, I started mowing that lawn. And my, my wife used to love to mow the lawn because that was her thing at her place up in like her country house mm. where she grew up was it was like a half a day activity, but it was fun because you mowed the lawn and like that was part sure. of your chores. Yeah. So makes sense. We get a mower. We have a very small lawn at our other place. So it probably takes you like half an hour to do the whole thing, start to finish. And then when we moved into the house that I grew up in as a kid, I was like, I can't wait to mow this lawn. And so I did a bunch of research. And one of the things in the research says you actually should be cutting your lawn from like if you go up and down, you should go left to right the next time because mm -hmm. the way you cut the blade of grass should change every time so that everything like isn't slanted in one side. So I was like, oh, I'm going to go diagonal on this biatch. <laughs> and I think it looks good and it looks classy out there, right? Yeah. So then I get the edger and now I'm like king shit, right? Because I'm so good at edging and it looks good. So much so I call out other people like, oh, look at this edging. Really nice stuff here. Right. And my wife's like, I don't notice a difference. And I was like, you suck. <laughs> um and so we had had a gas weed whacker. And by the way, I call it a weed whacker. I know someone call it calls it a weed whipper because the you know the little tiny pieces of plastic string look more like a whip than they do probably a, a whack. Okay, I don't know. Um, but I there's something about caring for the lawn that I just love, and I love when it looks really good. This is a pro tip for everyone out there. In fact, you too, Tucker. If you ever want your lawn to look amazing, it's going to cost you $4 to buy a bag of Malarganite. Malarganite? Malarganite. I just love what it's called. Right? Malarganite. So, this is an interesting story. It's a fertilizer for your lawn, but it's, you know, fertilizers can burn your lawn. Have you heard about that? No. Okay. So most fertilizers are, you know, a mixture of chemicals and organic matter. But if you put too much in an area, it can actually burn the lawn. Like there's a chemical reaction takes place and it'll actually burn away all the grass. Malarganite cannot burn your lawn. You can dump a whole thing in one spot and it won't burn because it is the byproduct of wastewater 
uh, like what they do to clean wastewater in Michigan. They end up with all this sludge at the bottom of the tanks. And for years, they were just like throwing it away. And there's one guy who's like, oh, I'll just take some of that. And he'd sprinkle it on his lawn. And eventually they're like, Dale, what are you doing? He goes, this is the best fertilizer you could ever find because it's like heavy silt, you know, from like, like, you know, it's taking all those impurities out of the rivers and stuff like that. And so uh, they started selling this stuff, right? And it becomes huge business. And the first time I'd ever heard of Malarganite was a buddy of mine who does stuff uh, like does groundskeeping says this is the best stuff ever because it's so rich in nitrogen and so rich in iron that it actually changes the color of your grass to this like deep green with blue hues. And so I was like, all right, guys, uh, enough talking about your, you know, your shit granules like I'm, <laughs> I'm done, done with this. And so I bought a bag a couple years ago and I went to a place and I'm like, do you guys have Malarganite? And they're like, I think so. And they had to unearth it in the back. Wow. And now it's become more common to find it at other hardware stores. I just, so I'll just take like a Dixie cup and I'll like sprinkle it all over the lawn. It smells to high heaven. Like it smells like. Okay. Poop. How long does the odor last? Uh, like probably like three days. But oh, if, okay. if you time it right with like the, the rain. Sure. So like. If you know it's you want it to mix with the rain, you do want it to mix the rain because that's how it kind of settles in and like reignites. And you put it on your lawn three times a year. Okay, you put it on Memorial Day, July Fourth, and then Labor Day. Um, and honestly, I've never had a thicker, more lush lawn. I have people who like will send me a text, be like, "Hey, it's just driving by your place. Your lawn looks <laughs> damn awesome." And you can, and because there's no chemical, this there's no chemical in this whatsoever. So you can actually put it in your garden. You can put it on your flower beds. You can put it with your vegetables, anything like that. And it's just ultra, ultra rich in all of this stuff. Um, I had like a couple bags I hadn't used, and I let them sit behind my shed all winter, and they were just fine the next year. Malarganite. So as I sit in the backyard at the place and I think about if I ever buy the place, what would I do with it? And the yard is something that I actually would love to do stuff with just to open up the space a bit more and have more grass area. But so like the grass area that's there already, everything is really uneven, kind of rocky in spots, really patchy. Um, and like uh, the earth is uneven. Yeah. Just not. And I don't mean like crazy uneven, like mm -hmm. mounds or whatever, but it's just not, even it's not, it feels really like it's been cut up a bunch of times and it's not like in good health. Probably earthworms is what it is. Is actually. that what that yeah, is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of earthworms. Yep. Is what you're saying. See, I would have thought that would be good for it. I would have assumed that would be good for it. It's good, but earthworms still have to like come to the like. Essentially, they create these little tiny mounds everywhere and untreated after years and years and years and years and years, you get that unevenness Got of it. it. So like, for example, my backyard, you know, we took great care of the front yard, put a sprinkler system there. The backyard has just kind of gone to hell. And so I've got weeds and it got just it. is not it's not good. But my plan is this. So when I redo my deck, finally, I'm going to cut the deck in half so I have more green space and we're going to lay sod. But before I lay sod, I'm going to go back there with Roundup and I'm going to kill all the grass, which will also kill all the weeds that are there. Right. And then I'm going to bring in dirt and I'm going to regrade the backyard. Now, your backyard should have a negative grade, meaning that it's essentially like a half an inch higher from where your house is leading down to like where for you, like your back alley is mm -hmm. so that when rain and water come, it moves away from the house. It moves mm -hmm. away from the foundation. So you could do the same thing where you just like essentially brought in sod mm. and then laid that sod down and it would, you know, more or less like even itself out. And then you'd have nice, beautiful. So it's basically putting grass. grass on top of grass is yeah. what, what I, what I do. Mm -hmm. I would, okay. That was, we're just curious about what that process would be. Um, Cause I'd, I would love to just, there's a lot of space that could be opened up in the mm -hmm. back with just more grass space. Um, I wouldn't plant a garden. I not. I don't have a green thumb. I'm not interested in being outside and digging around and stuff. But I would love to have a couple of planted areas mm -hmm. that are just that take care of themselves, right? That are bushes or something that right. rabbits could be underneath and hide in and live in. Sure, you would love uh, like daylilies. Daylilies are the first thing that come up every single year, and it's this big green bushy thing. You don't have to do shit with them, mm. and they're great in drought. They're great in rain. They're just they're a perfect like thing that grows, and it's got beautiful flowers. And the most work you have to do is 
in the spring, after everything's died over the winter, you take a rake and you just rake over them and pull mm. away the dead stuff and you're good to go. I like that. And I've, daylilies are almost impossible to kill. I have a theory that someone is poisoning rabbits in my neighborhood. Really? Yeah. Because I've just like now this summer the found the third dead rabbit on my property Ooh. that um, has no visible marks from being attacked. Okay. And they just, it's like they lie down and die. And... There to the um, east, no, to the west of me, um, across the alleyway, there are two massive gardens. One is a big flower garden, massive, and another one is a big vegetable garden in the backyard. Like they bring their stuff to the farmers market in downtown whenever that shows up. Right, it's roped off. They always have lots of people working back there, and so I keep seeing these rabbits dying, and I'm finding them on my property. And I went around my garage and everything to go, is there something that I have maybe that's leaking or that they're getting into, right? Is there like a canister of antifreeze I don't know about or something? I can't find anything that would be like, okay, there's something that's definitely killing them from where I'm at I, that I can find. So the only theory I have is that, okay, they're using at one of these other two gardens that are massive, that are clearly well-kept and are being protected they're probably putting something out that mm. that gets the rabbits to, to try to try to kill them. And so the only thing is that I don't know, I'm not going to go ask my neighbors straight up and, but I'm also not going to like find the next dead rabbit and then go get it tested. Right. Like I don't really have a way to do that. So I don't quite know what to do unless there's something I can just look for. I could see because they're, you know, their gardens are out in the open. Right. Mm -hmm. So they're visible from the alleyway. And it's just a theory too, right? Like it could be something else going on entirely. Like there's just a like there's a rabbit mafia or so, and they're off of right, each other. Right, something like no, that. Peter Cottontail knows too much. I mean, I would assume if they're being killed by cats, they would be eviscerated, right? Or do or something, right? If something was getting to them, but they're they're dying and then I'm finding them in rigor. And it's weird. Um, I think that the thing that is most concerning to me is the fact that like, you know, if you're poisoning rabbits in some yes. way, you have the potential of poisoning someone's pet. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Now I haven't, now I guess, I mean, r rabbits are going to be the big terror for their gardens. I don't think they're worried about squirrels or anything like that. So I don't know if I, if I start seeing dead squirrels or something, other animals too, right. then I guess I would know for sure. So I, I'm at three right now. I found three rabbits <sighs> in the past, like two months. Um, and it's just, this, and uh, yeah, and it's just weird. But also, the second one that I found, I found it because of the smell. Oh. It, right? And so it's like, I don't want to be constantly having to deal with dead animals. You know, like, if I found three on my property, that means other people are finding them on theirs. Right. right. So I got to get to the bottom of it. Have you ever used the neighborhood app? I haven't. I should start doing that. But now I wonder if this guy who came to my campfire last night was like, some fucking asshole wouldn't let me join <laughs> his, his, his I campfire. Wouldn't, I wouldn't, you wouldn't let me join it. So I had to go out and I had to poison eight rabbits to <laughs> take my revenge <laughs> on. I just had to do something to make yeah, me feel good. I thought good. he would have got my note. I left him with all the rabbits. Oh. Yeah. No, thank you. Do you want to hear a horrific story? Like, should we end this on like weird animal deaths? Like, by the way, episode three hundred, we did it, dude. Let's talk about episode three hundred. We haven't really, um, we haven't really reminisced yeah. at all yet. So, episode three hundred. I was thinking today, you've lived in three different places since we started this. <laughs> Around every one hundred episodes, you change your your living situation. Um, and that's right, right? Because your, your place, like it. you know, like that first place where we used it as a temporary studio for a for a little bit. Oh, so, okay, yeah. I mean, I was in Moorhead. Moorhead, yeah. And then you moved into your place in West Fargo. Well, no, so I was in the Moorhead place, and then I moved into my mom's place in South Fargo. Oh God, and you then moved I'm, in four. Places. I'm in the fourth place. Fourth place. Yeah, since we started this podcast. Wow. Yeah, I'm in the first. Well, no, well, you you were living in move you were living point? near Agassiz. Was I? I think you were in the Agency House. Did we? We didn't start this in 2016. Oh no, no, you're did totally we? right. No, you're totally yeah. right. You've been in the same place the entire time. Yeah, that's right. It's weird because I moved into the place I'm in now in 2016, and so I try and think of time, but like two years disappeared there, right? Like during right. the pandemic, so it's hard right. for me to figure out where I was at certain points. I've got a real morbid thing of like when people are like, "How long have we been doing this?" I'm like. Well, let's see. Uh, I've been on KFGO for seven years because my mom died in 2015. And, and I'm like, oh, whoa, that's a weird calendar. 
You know, just remember like. Well, but that's a massive know, life. Event. It is right. It was like a life changer. Yeah. Um, okay. So you've been in four different places. I was trying to count the number of studio spaces that we've used, and I think we're up to nine. Okay, let's see. I mean, we had the the two, the two different rooms. Are we counting them as two or one when we were at I the I think arts those are two different spaces. Two different spaces. So yep. those are two different spaces. Uh, currently, one we've got right now. Right. The, the, the one across the street. Yep. At the realtor's place. Yep. The uh, the when you had your poker job, we recorded yep, there that was, at the very so that was beginning. The very beginning. Yep. We used my old apartment like once or uh-huh. twice. The virtual space we used. Yeah, when you seven. consider that, um, I think that might be it. I feel like there's got to be at least one more. No, I think that's it. I mean. Technically, the Red River Zoo for one episode because that was our one I don't mo- think, I don't, a, a, mo- a mobile recording studio. Think about that. Sure, because okay. we intended to do a lot more of those. That's that didn't right. really happen. That's right. Yep. Yep. Is there anything else? We'll go with nine. If we're counting the nine. zoo, if we're counting, did you the count zoo. in the count the current place we're in right now? Yep, right. Yep. 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 Yeah. 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 We've been all over the place, baby. I like the idea of more of these uh, just being streamed live as we're recording them yeah might be kind of fun to do more it's nice because people are like god they don't really cut anything out of these episodes right and this is real they'll get to hear how uh how the uh what what's the is it the bacon that's always referred to as gets made the sausage. pork the sausage, sausage. i can't remember <laughs> you know that old that old <laughs> chestnut how the bacon gets made <laughs> um which is a great segue into my animal story Jill tells a horrific story of one Easter. It sounds like it's Jill's animal story and it is, not but your But Jill animal will story. never be on this show. And she'll probably not tell it as good as you. No. Because I... Were you present? No, I was not. Okay. So she was coming down for Easter. They were going to have Easter dinner in Fargo, and she was still in high school. And Where'd she live? This is in Hillsboro. She's in Hillsboro, so she and her folks are driving down because Amy and Ryan, her brother and sister, lived in Fargo. And so they're driving down, and on the highway, they notice a dead rabbit, like a dead little white rabbit on the side of the road. And they're like, oh, that's so sad. And then they notice another one and another one. (laughs) And they're like, what is going on? Well, as they are, you know, continuing down the interstate, they encounter this semi truck that has a door that's open on the back, like blowing over the wind. And so. Oh, no. They are. oh. Oh, no. They are, they are not, it's not a semi truck full of rabbits. These are piglets oh, no. that are being bounced out and then hitting the interstate. And so the they, they start honk, 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 honk. And they're waving and they're waving at this guy. And the trucker's like, yeah, don't, don't tread on me. I got to get this load down to Arkansas. And, uh, they said finally he like kind of realized what was going over and pulled over the side of the road, <laughs> but they're like he probably lost like fifteen or twenty oh of these God. piglets. That's like, so sad. Isn't that horrific? <laughs> and so the they've never told Jill's sister the story because Jill's sister is very empathetic to animals mm. and like cannot handle that type of thing. So much so that previous guest Natalie Deutsch Laplante now recently. T- when you think of Natalie Deutsch, name four words that describe her from when you grew up. Like loud, okay. Uh, freckles, okay. Um, ugh. <laughs> I mean, things that like really, uh, like her identity was built around these things. Her identity, yeah. Oh, uh, being vegetarian, being vegetarian, yep, right? Yep, yep. So, yep. I mean, there's some goading there, but you got to it in three, right? Okay, so. <laughs> When she first started telling me that Sorry, she was Natalie. eating meat, <laughs> I mean, on a previous like radio show that you and I hosted, mm-hmm. a question was asked of Natalie, <laughs> if there was a gun to your mother's head, and it was like, Natalie, eat this I had, chicken McNugget. I had McNugget. asked her that at the camp out for X-Men, mm-hmm. and this is what she had said. <laughs> and her response was, it would be like, we're going to shoot your mom, or you eat this one chicken nugget. And her response is... I hope my mom would understand. <laughs> um, to be fair, she just didn't want to lose the argument. Right. She just didn't want to have to give ground. <laughs> so, I mean, Natalie, like, and like, she was never someone who like pushed vegetarianism on no, you. It was just her like, thing. It was just her thing. Yeah. So when I found out she was eating meat, I was dumbfounded. Then she tells me that uh, they just slaughtered on her farm 
20 chickens that they raised from like eggs and then they slaughtered the chickens, cut the head off, and they had to buy a plucking machine. <laughs> now, this plucking machine is a big, round, like, kettle, and inside of it are what appears to be rubber hot dogs. And the mm. whole side of it is, like, like filled oh, with rubber. Oh, so it just, like, wax them off? And yeah, and so it, like, spins around in there, and it <laughs> wax, and it, like, pulls all the feathers off. I want to hear what that sounds like. Oh, <laughs> trust me. I watched a video of it, and I was like, oh, my God. God. And like the chicken feet are so yellow still. They're so yellow. And so I watched this. And so Jill's been, it's been brought to Jill's attention like three times since this like first thing with Natalie started. And she was just like, I can't, I can't anymore. I just, it's too much for me. And like Amy heard it and Amy was like, oh my God. <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, you gotta know how the bacon gets made. <laughs> But she also, Jill has recently decided that she no longer wants to eat pork. She doesn't like fowl, so she's only going to eat beef. And I was like, why? That friggin' sucks. And she never has been a fish person. But hold, hold on, like, why though? She's like, I don't like the taste of it. I don't like the taste of turkey. She's I don't like, like the, the taste, taste of chicken? chicken? No. That she's lying. That's not true. She won't let me include it on menus at like our house. Like, if I'm going to be like, I'm going to do a broasted chicken tonight, or I'm going to do. It, we don't call it beer can chicken. We call it fresca chicken because I use fresca in my recipe. It, is it like too spicy? Like I just no, it's just spicy. No, no, it's just she doesn't. I mean, maybe it's I'm, like, I mean it shouldn't be spicy. You know I'm just wondering like, what her palate. You know how like fowl, like you tear it and it kind of becomes like a like stringy, yeah. like when you tear. Yeah. I don't think she likes that. Oh, it's a texture thing. Maybe, uh, maybe, but she also said taste, and she's never liked pork. And the and here's what's interesting. Sucks. The only beef she likes is the ultra lean or like super expensive cut. So she likes the, like a fillet. Okay. Oh, but so she'll take a steak that's just a cut. She yeah. doesn't. It doesn't need to be ground beef. Correct. Yeah. Because I mean that's got similar. It can have similar texture. I agree. Right. It's it's still muscle fiber being mm -hmm. cut. And oftentimes when you get a steak, if you're getting it right, it's not cooked all the way. Right. Right. It's You're still really missing out on like the beauty. And given since she and I have started dating, she or at least and now married, of course, <laughs> um, she has gotten to the point now where she used to have like a steak well done. And I was like, this yeah. pains. This actually hurts me to make this. You're missing out on life's great pleasures right. if you do that. The, you're cooking all of the delicious juices out of it. And so she's now down to the point of where like she'll eat like a medium burger or steak. I'm in like medium rare is too much for her, but that's where I like mine. But at least she like is closer on there. So she's not eating just like a, a hockey puck mm -hmm. when offered to her, mm -hmm. but she misses out on great stuff. Like um, there's a restaurant in Fargo called Porter Creek. You ever eat at Porter Creek? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. I made your dad take me to Porter Creek recently. Nice. And I get the same thing every time I go there, which is their French bone in pork chop. It's done to a, like a medium. Because, you know, there used to be the thing about how you can't eat pork that's pink in the middle. Right. And now, because of modern refrigeration techniques, like, you can eat, like, a medium done pork. It's all right. Mm. And it's all right to do that. Chicken, you're still supposed to cook the whole way through. So, shouldn't be any pink in chicken. But they serve it with an apricot chutney, this mashed, like, sweet potato, a couple spears of asparagus, and then there's a glaze on the pork chop. It is so freaking good that I will, like, slurp the bone. It's so delicious. So good. Mm. And Jill will never experience that because she's just silly. She's a silly, silly goose. Um, hey, silly gooses. Thanks for coming along on this adventure. And I know that it's daunting to listen to every episode, but you've got people like Mikey Sunroom. Yeah. Um, and you really should listen to every episode because you will not be able to follow. Yeah, there's such a through line. <laughs> if, you, if you've arrived at this point, I'll, gi I'll give you the next clue. Keyhole. <laughs> yeah. I do say, like, I, I think uh, just for funsies, we should just, when we do record, maybe we will just have a live stream out there, too, if people want to interact with us while we're doing it. Yeah. Start building that up a little bit. Yeah. Let's not add video for a while, yeah. because I don't feel like I'm video ready right not now. Not ready for it. I, I'll, I'll have to create a set for us that I want to do. You know what we could do is... I know we've been meaning to do this one where we force a kid to eat a hundred chicken nuggets while we, and we have to broadcast until he finishes the hundred chicken nuggets. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a static screen for us, just the audio, but it's a live video of him <laughs> eating nug after I don't nug think after it nug. Takes, I don't think it takes Madison long to get those nuggies down. A hundred nuggets. I know it's a lot. I'm saying, I believe 
Madison, if I may say, is ready for the. He was the one who brought yeah. it up, right? So if we're gonna have anyone do it, it's gonna be him. And I think we need to up the number from a hundred for him. Yeah, Jesus, dude. I think he finishes a hundred in under twenty minutes. I think he does. What? I think he's at at least three to four nuggets a minute. <laughs> I think no I'm, way. I'm not saying it's healthy. <laughs> I'm okay. saying okay. I bet Mattis, that's what he does. I bet he hits. I bet he gets to 100 in under 20 minutes. So first of all, you'd have to eat five nuggets a minute <laughs> yeah. to hit 100. I bet he could. Secondly, it would be one thing to say, like, you need to eat five nuggets in a minute. Like, I could do that. But then a minute after and a minute after. And you have to do that 20 times over. <laughs> At one point, like, you just throw. Like, your body just can't handle that much. How long do you think it takes him to do 100 then? An hour? I think it takes him an hour. Takes him an hour? I think the challenge we put out there is you, that you, you have to eat 100 nuggets in under an hour. Your argument is persuasive. Okay. It makes sense to me what you're saying. Right. Because at an, at an hour, then you can average, if you're averaging two nuggets a minute, that's 120 nuggets. So you'd be fine. <laughs> so is it a matter of, we want to see how fast you can eat 100 nuggets or how many nuggets you can eat in an hour? But yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's. Under an hour. Can you eat can you eat a hundred in under an hour? Mm-hmm. Are you able to do it? Can you cross the Even finish McDonald's line? McDonald's would be like, we don't advise that. Yeah. We don't think you should do it. I uh, think I mean, and here's the thing, like, do we go and get nuggets from different restaurants and throw them all in the mix? So it's like you're it's not just McDonald's no. nuggies. There's also Burger King nuggies oh, in God. here. You're gonna you're Wendy's you're, has nuggies, right? Chick fil A's got nuggies, yeah. but they don't like the gays. <laughs> So I don't patronize them. We won't make uh-uh. we won't make Madison I'm not gonna eat. Give, I'm not going to give them eat those nuggets. nuggets. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's got to be all from the same place. Yeah. Now here's another question too. If does he I, dip? If I was eating these, does he tip? Dip. Like for, oh, dip. <laughs> I was like, for the nuggets, you tip for the nuggets. <laughs> he, he's not um, required to pay. This for isn't these a quarter nuggets. pounder with cheese. <laughs> yeah, I think that he has to be allowed to have dips. And maybe oh, yeah. that's the thing is we open it up beyond just what McDonald's offers for dips. So like, but I mean, most people love honey, right? Like they, the honey is what they dip. It makes you wonder though, what will be easier in the long run? Like mm-hmm. if I'm gonna if I'm gonna hit twenty nuggies. I want dips. I ain't raw dog in those. I might no. raw dog one or two on the way home. The, the breading's so crispy, you need the nugget to coat your throat to let it go down your gullet. Well, but you can, I mean, you can raw dog the first couple on the way home. Sure. Which is what I do, because you're not going to open a dipping packet while you're there. Wait a minute, you're eating your nuggets on the way home? Yeah, if I go get, it's just like french fries, they're right there, you can grab them. I don't, I don't do that. You don't do that? I do not do that. You wait till you get home before you hit the I french do. fries? I leave the bag closed. What? Yeah, and I wait until I get home so I can enjoy the I there. think you're lying. I'm telling I you. I think this is utter bullshit. I'm telling you 100% tr- Hold on. I get Hold that. On. I get that I have a problem with we're impulse gonna do, control. We're going to do something because this is episode 300 that is unheard of. Are we bringing Jill into this? I'm bringing my wife into this. Can you, can I you can hear, hear this? It, yeah. Okay, good. Hello. Hey, listen, this is live on my podcast right now, okay? okay? This is important. When we go to a fast food place, what's my rule after we get the food? Um, you like to look in the bag to see if it's there? Right. <laughs> there, <laughs> there is the check, but <laughs> but but what's what's my what's my steadfast rule that you disagree on? Once we have the food and we're headed home. I don't know. Oh, come on. Yes, you do. You do know this. I swear to God, you know this. What What do you do with the French fries that I don't do? Oh, car fries are way better in the in the car. Yeah, see? Yeah, see? yeah, yeah. Yeah, Tucker well, said you, he... I didn't know what kind of fast food you're talking, because it wouldn't be the same with, like, tacos. No, no, no. Like, the taco... You're not going to... But, like, you would with potato Olays, wouldn't you? You'd sure. have a couple yeah. Olays. But I, I don't. No, you don't. No, but I do check the bag. I didn't even think about that one. That's yeah. a good point. All right. Thank you for making your first ever appearance on my 300th episode of this to back me up. Sounds good. Bye. Uh. Oh, JJ. I actually, I actually almost, check, I almost passed you out. Check the bed to make sure it's there. <laughs> I almost and passed I, out just I, now. I, I I'm do. not joking. <laughs> it's true. Because as a person who does not eat like <laughs> mustard, I do open the bag and I will like 
I can pick up a wrapped burger and tell you whether or not they made it the way I wanted by by how the burger appears to me. Oh, check to oh. make sure it's there. Like, oh, like there's some point in my life where like I went home and I'm like, bag seems light, but it doesn't matter. Going home to eat my feelings, and then I open it and there's nothing in the bag. I mean, that's never happened to me, but it would probably be pretty good if it did. Oh, oh my God. Okay. <laughs> that's a um, great way to end up. So yeah. Remember like a couple minutes ago when I'm like, well, Jill, who will never be on this before? <laughs> I wonder if I'm going to be in trouble when I get home. Oh, wow. Probably. That was so good. All right. Well, remember, folks, save your curly fries for when you're at home. And by the way, uh, going forward... I want to make this nugget thing happen, and I want to thank the people who've given to us on Patreon, because Patreon not only helps us keep the lights on around this place, but also it's going to go towards fueling this nugget discussion. So if you want to, if you want to go to Patreon, you can find it on the JJ Meets World website, and you don't have to give on a monthly basis if you want. You want to give just like $5. Here's what I'm going to do. This is how many nuggets Madison's going to eat. We are going to raise money on our Patreon, and that'll be how many nuggets we can oh, buy. God so you give it. us $100, he's going to eat $100 worth <laughs> like of nuggets. He's going to take the bullet he's for this take one. This one. <laughs> but if you um, get to, if 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 he eats 100 nuggets mm-hmm. in under an hour, you have to take a shot of honey mustard. No. I think. I've done that for this already. Do you remember what happened? <laughs> yeah, I, I almost pooped my pants oh, yeah. because I was gagging so hard. <laughs> and now I can't drink Dr. Pepper <laughs> ever again because I use that to wash the oh. taste of French's mustard. You also made that spoonful oh so God. big. Dude, I seriously, when Jill said that, I started blacking out. <laughs> like, I, my body clenched so hard from the laughing. I like I was losing my vision. Is I, is is this better than when the seat crumbled underneath so me, this, or is it equal? Here, I, I'm like my, my laughing has already mostly subsided at this point. Mm-hmm. I think I'll have to time it out because that one like reignited after the bag. a bit. But so, it was just her delivery of that okay. line has murdered me. Anyways, this has been fun. So fun three hundredth, happy three hundredth episode. JJ. Happy three hundredth episode, and thanks to the uh, Grocery Beggars Union Local four hundred six for sponsoring this episode. That's going to wrap it up for today's show. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to help us continue to produce new episodes each week, visit JJMeetsWorld.com, where you can donate to our Patreon, pick up some swag at the merch shop, or follow our link to Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, all the sites the cool kids are using these days. JJ Meets World is produced every week by Tucker Lucas. You can find out more about Tucker's work by visiting moonbasemaria.com. If you want to get in touch with your host with the most, check out linebenders.com where you can find direct contact info for JJ or booking information. Jill and I had planned out that bit from episode 200, and we just now were able to accomplish it. So for episode 400... Uh, We're going to do this thing where I pretend that I've been uh, drafted to be a NASA 